Good morning and welcome to episode four of our limited series here at Justice Action Network called Unconventional. Episode four is very near and dear to my heart and it's entitled Women in Our Justice System. And we have a really special panel um, from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, my home state, um, that's going to kick off this episode and all of these individuals were instrumental, um, you know, back in 2018 um, in passage of some very important dignity legislation, which is actually the first dignity bill in the entire country to make it to a governor's desk. And then that bill laid the foundation um, uh, for a little piece of legislation known as the First Step Act, which was groundbreaking prison and sentencing reform legislation that was signed into law in 2018. Um, so I, I wanna introduce um, first and foremost, Josh Crawford with the Pegasus Institute, who's worked with us for several years now. Um, the indomitable um, Senator Julie Rocky Adams, who is, um, if I'm not mistaken, the first female majority caucus chair in the history of the Kentucky State Senate. Um, and by the way, she was voted into that position right after passage of that dignity bill, not that we're taking credit for, for her accomplishment or anything, but it is a great narrative uh, for our work. Erica Thompson, um, who's coming to us from Owensboro, um, who's going to share her experiences as a pregnant woman entangled um, in a broken justice system. And then, of course, Jackie McGranahan um, from the ACLU Kentucky, who's worked with us um, alongside Josh in a bipartisan way over the last few years. Um, towards solutions um, for a lot of the challenges that we're facing in our justice system. So Josh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. It takes a very confident man to moderate a panel of such powerful Kentucky women. Well, thank you very much, Holly. Uh, I hope to live up to that uh, characterization. Um, and thank you to the panel for, for being here uh, with us this morning. And thank you for those of you uh, who are watching, as Holly indicated, this is a a topic that a lot of us care about very deeply. Um, and so with that, Senator Adams, I'd like to start with you, uh, lawmaker in the country to pass a dignity bill for incarcerated women, uh, primarily focused on eliminating uh, shackling of pregnant women and expanding treatment for those with addiction issues. Uh, the bill started a national movement around treating incarcerated women better. Now you're looking to introduce a Dignity 2 legislation that would, among other things, ban solitary confinement for pregnant women and allow incarcerated mothers supervised visits with their babies. Why is it important to you to continue to pursue these issues and give a voice to these women? Thanks, Josh. And um, I guess kind of let me start out and talk a little bit about the first Dignity Bill. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we were all sitting around a room and we were trying to figure out why Kentucky's incarceration rate was just exploding. It wasn't necessarily just exploding with the male population, but it was exploding in, on the female side of things. And so as we all have figured out, um, the criminal justice system is so big, it's, it's a beast. And it's like, where do you even start to try to make reforms? And in Kentucky, we were kind of an outlier because our female population incarceration rate was so much higher. I think we were like the second highest in the country. And we said, why don't we focus just on the female component? Um, as you know, the criminal justice says the prison system is designed for men. I mean, we only assumed that men were going to prison. The truth is women were going, women were going and they were pregnant. Women were going to jail and they, um, they didn't have proper undergarments. They didn't have the proper nutrition. I mean, incarcerating a woman is just a very different thing than incarcerating a man. And so we figured that that was a really good place to start to focus our efforts because no one was really doing it. And, um, it, and I think that primarily what touched me the most and why I decided to spend my time trying to pass that first dignity bill is I remember because I'm a mom and I remember the very first when I had my first child and they handed him to me it was a game changer it was an absolute life changer and I thought to myself we have women in prison who were trying to figure out how to reform trying to get them off of drugs and we've shackled them and they can't hold their baby like I was able to hold my baby. 
And I'm telling you, that's the one shot we have, I think, in that whole realization of, I now have to perform for this child that I just brought into the world. And so for me, that was a great place to start. And so as you know, the Dignity Bill, we, we unshackled the women giving birth. We decided to work on um, providing feminine hygiene products and undergarments and some sort of dignity while they were in prison. And I'll tell you, um, I think that the efforts that we have made on that one were so compelling and so strong in kind of reforming this area of our criminal justice system that I thought there's so many more places we can go to improving the lives of these women and reforming and making them be um, an integral part of our society again. And so that's why I'm so passionate about, you know, having and, I, and trust me, I'm not an expert on any of these things by any stretch of the imagination. I need really smart people who come to me and say, Julie, here's what we need to do. And so um, I have relied um, so closely on the advice of the Justice Action Network and all these other ancillary groups to help me figure out what the right thing to do is. Erica, I kind of want to kick it over to you now. Um, I've heard Senator Adams talk uh, a lot about being compelled to act because of stories like yours. She's, she talked a bit about it just now. Would you mind sharing some of your experiences uh, while being pregnant and incarcerated and sort of the unique challenges that you faced because of that? Absolutely. Um, my name is Erica. I'm a person that has been in long-term recovery for going on four years now. Um, I lived with substance abuse disorder for 20 years of my life. I've been in and out of prisons, jails, um, basically any kind of institution um, that you could think of that drugs will take you, I've been there. Um, in 2013, I was pregnant uh, when I was arrested. Um, at this time, I was very scared. My self-worth was non-existent. I didn't have custody of the children that I already had. So finding out that I was pregnant was already terrifying, but then add getting arrested to it, 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 it put me in a state of blind terror. Um, what's worse is that I was being sent to KCIW um, and being comfortable in my county jail because I'd been arrested um, enough times to kind of know everybody, know how things work. Um, when I was shipped to, to Pee Wee Valley, it was a complete, um, it was a complete shock. Um, you get in there, you wear a yellow jumpsuit. Um, you're kind of segregated with other pregnant moms. Um, we all live together. We wear the same color uniforms. Everybody knew it was pregnant. Um, oh, just a lot, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. Um, you're basically in a birthing system or, you know, center that nobody used to get to come home to. Um, throughout my pregnancy, I knew I had no way to support my baby. I knew that he would have a better life if I, um, went through with an adoption. That's the choice that I made, the best choice for everybody involved. Um, when I went into labor, I had to have a C-section. I knew that up front. Um, the feeling of fear just those last couple days wondering how it was going to happen what was going to um would they get me to the hospital quick enough um just a, a, a lot of fear in there um when i went into the hospital to have a c-section i was shackled to my bed um i can remember a nurse um just kind of being like hey is that necessary i just had a spinal i was going you know in for a pretty a pretty serious surgery um i remained handcuffed throughout my delivery, throughout the whole time I was at the hospital. Um, that first shower that you have after you have a baby, um, it's always been a real emotional time. You know, a part of, a part of you is out in the world now. Um, I, I took that shower shackled um, in a room by myself with no help. Um, I was in there with another mother that had a baby and her baby was born addicted to methadone. So while I'm sitting here and going through this stuff with my child, I'm also dealing with somebody in a bed right beside me that their baby is crying unconsolably. Um, it was very, very emotional. Um, 
after I had the baby, I went back in general population. Um, my dorm was the furthest um, from what they call the medical building. So three days after having a C-section, I had to walk from the furthest dorm all the way to the medical building to get uh, my medication. Um, you know, three, three days after a C-section, like you shouldn't, you shouldn't be walking. You shouldn't, I'm, you shouldn't have to walk that far just to get your medication. Um, postpartum, uh, period isn't recognized in jail. It's not that they don't care. There's no, um, special treatment. There's no, you get two mats. <laughs> you sleep on two mats that are about this thick. Um, you know, we all talk about giving folks second chances, but some of us would never had our first chance. When I was finally given chance at treatment and was serious about it, I flourished. I'm a mother again. Um, I just had a baby. I run an online business. I'm in a healthy relationship. Um, pregnancy and delivery this time um, really made me put some things into perspective about how scarred I was from my previous pregnancy being incarcerated. Um, it was, it was very different after being uh, through something like that. Um, today I homeschool my children. I cook dinner every night. I'm not an animal. I was sick. My life experiences influence my advocacy. I believe in the values presented here by Senator Adams. While this bill won't fix the whole system, it's another step from Senator Adams to restore dignity back to incarcerated women overall. Erica, you, you mentioned that it was 2013 when you went through this. Do you think that things would be further complicated for you if you were uh, pregnant and then went through labor and delivery now, given uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the way that that has changed corrections some? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't imagine being in that situation, being um, separated from society. Um, having unrealistic fears because you don't know what daily living is. Um, you're in there, you're scared, you only know what they tell you. And half the time they don't want to tell you tell you anything. Um, securities and, and things like that. Um, when I went to the hospital in 2013, it was scheduled and I couldn't know when that date was, which is understandable because of security, but that just that not knowing. Right. That Stomach, not knowing when they're going to call you and, hey, you're going to have a baby. I couldn't imagine um, being put in that situation with the COVID pandemic. Jackie, I want to bring you in now. Um, you and I have only known each other a short time, but I've still found time to joke with you about what strange bedfellows Pegasus and the ACLU make. Uh, but we're sort of in lockstep uh, on these policies, the policies that Senator Adams is pursuing. Uh, related to pregnant women behind bars. Why do you think that these issues cut across uh, party or ideological lines? Oh, Jackie, you're muted. Sorry, I do that every time. It does <laughs> <laughs> you know, first of all, whether someone knows it or not, everyone has been touched by our justice system. The Department of Corrections is one of the biggest expenditures in our state's budget. So the more we invest in incarcerating folks, the less we invest in communities to ensure that everyone has access to health care, housing, education, and most importantly, opportunity. We all need to set aside ideological purity for pragmatism. We have to work together if we want to make the changes necessary to integrate families back into society. Further, I think honestly, most folks have been impacted by substance use disorder or poverty. If not themselves, then someone that they love. You know, this has touched all of us. And there are, there are ways like meaningful access to treatment that can address the underlying issues while keeping families whole and saving money. You know, it's a win for everyone. You know, and this bill gets us closer to that by protecting and supporting families and our greatest asset, our children. Absolutely. Senator Adams, we've already mentioned that this bill would um, end solitary confinement for uh, pregnant women, that it would uh, create a system visits uh, 
for, for women with their children, whether they've delivered them while incarcerated or not. Uh, but you're also tackling a, a somewhat sensitive policing reform issue in this bill. Uh, and that would make any sexual contact between uh, a police officer and, and an individual who is in custody uh, illegal, and it would eliminate consent as a, a potential defense for that sexual encounter. Um, has that been a, a problem here in Kentucky uh, and sort of what compels you to address this issue? Um, and thanks. And I kind of want to go back to something that Jackie said really quickly, and that is kind of the bipartisan, like we have to, I think, tackle these issues in a bipartisan way. And I think one of the, um, one of the, the things why I had so much resistance at the beginning and passing the first dignity bill was just honestly that no one had thought about treating women differently than men. And so the education piece was so vital in, um, in getting that done. And I heard a statistic and I believe it to be true, but it says 97% of everybody who goes to jail gets out. So what do you want that 97% to look like? Do you want them to be a, a whole person? Do you want them to be a reformed person? Do you want them to be a clean person? And so all of these things that we're talking about, I think go to um, it, go to the type of person we wanna see once they get out of jail. Um, and so when we talk about the second dignity bill, that one kind of uh, policing reform piece, I think is really critical because um, I think the vast majority of law enforcement are good people. You know, they do the right thing. They're a critical component in keeping our community safe and our community strong. But as in any profession, we do have some bad actors and we do have some bad actions. And so what this piece of the bill will do is basically it deals with the consent issue so that if you are detained by a police officer, um, there can be no sexual contact between that detainee and that officer. Um, because really it's, it, it's based in power. And so there's all these things that you think about. It really is, it, it, they always rely on, well, there was a consent. Let's eliminate that ability for people to use consent as a reason for denying someone's civil rights. Because that's what's happening here is that um, there was an um, there was an incident in um, Hopkinsville. There was an incident really recently in Louisville. We found out that an officer had been you know riding by um, bars and restaurants, picking up women who are drunk that won't be a credible um, witness against them and basically saying, I'm not going to take you to jail if you have sex with me or if you do, you know, some other sexual favor for me. That's wrong. And so, like I said, we have a vast majority of people who do things the right way. But I think if we tackle that consent and remove that as a barrier, then um, we're going to see a whole different set of circumstances fall out for primarily women in our, um, that are being um, scared about being taken in for yeah. one reason or another. It makes perfect sense to me. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you again real quick because we've got a question here in the chat. Um, uh, somebody listening from Ohio, Andrea, uh, has a question about, uh, have you encountered any resistance or pushback from the Department of Corrections uh, about making these changes? Um, We'll, we'll address the, the second part of her question sort of more fully at the end, uh, but, but as it relates to this, have you had any sort of pushback from Department of Corrections on this? Do you know, so far, I have not, because I think at everyone's core, they think, oh, yeah, we probably need to fix this. I mean, you know, I think the biggest misstep in politics is that you think something's a no-brainer and it should automatically pass, and in the same time, you're like, wait a minute, that's a no-brainer, why aren't we passing this? Um, but so far, I think everybody kind of understands that, um, you know, when it comes to consent, we probably need to legislate consent. Right. Um, Erica, having heard some of the conversations about some of the specific reforms this time around, 
Um, what do you think that these would mean for incarcerated women in Kentucky? These changes are, are, are another step towards dignity for incarcerated women. You know, recommending a postpartum period prevents anyone from going through what I went through after my C-section. Um, that time is a very traumatic, stressful period. And once you add in incarceration, it can be dangerous. Um, these mother, you know, these mothers deserve access to services that um, medical and mental health providers have determined necessary for safe and healthy recovery from, pre you know, from pregnant women, especially the trauma of being incarcerated and separated from your child. Um, facilitated visits between mother and child, you know, in a time with a social worker. Um, helps to integrate the family back into society to build that bond um, to set them up for success. Um, you know, being shackled while you're pregnant, I was shackled when I went to go have my ultrasound. That's a special moment for a mother. Um, to hear the chains dragging, you know, they, they sit you in a wheelchair, your, your legs are shackled, your, your hands are shackled. They put a blanket over you. Um, and they push you up, you know, a corrections officer pushes you to your ultrasound room. Um, and just to have everybody stop and stare, um, just to, to have to go through those feelings, being emotional, to be handcuffed the whole time you're in the hospital. Um, it prevents you from building that bond. It prevents you from, from having a successful and, and pleasant experience. You know, pregnancy and childbirth is, is supposed to be special. Um, and I feel like sometimes that it's, it's taken from you. Uh, Jackie, at Pegasus, we care a lot about crime victims, but especially for women in our criminal justice system, victim and offender are labels that they may wear simultaneously, or at least in close proximity with one another. Can you talk a bit about this? Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> You know, oftentimes, especially in the state capitol, people create this dichotomy of victims and perpetrators of crime. You know, and you hear folks talk about these people as if they're two different and opposing groups, you know, that are at odds with each other. And this is 100% not reality. People living in vulnerable conditions for example, people living with substance use disorder, you know, they may, may be more likely to commit a crime and get caught. And, but then, and they're more likely to do that than your average Joe or someone else that you know. But they're also more likely to be the victim of a crime as well. And certainly many of the women that I've served have been, vic have been victimized and survived trauma. This is why we truly want to make, sa make people safer and just punishing them does not invest in people. Absolutely does not. You know, it doesn't invest in their families and their communities. And this is what this bill is doing. You know, and finally, I want to add, I am also a formerly incarcerated person, you know, and the women that I was incarcerated with, they were exploited by their abusers, you know, and they've been and survived some horrible, horrible traumas, you know, and because they're fearful of the justice system, they're hesitant to call the police, even when they're in danger, even when their life is on the line, you know, and we can't, we can't forget about those folks. Erica, I saw you nodding your head through uh, a lot of that. Was that, was that your experience and a lot of the women you interacted with, uh, both while you were incarcerated and, uh, and after? Absolutely. Um, she, you know, described it perfectly. Um, there, there is no, there is no difference when you're in there, what, what you're in there for, um, what, what happened. You should still be treated with some kind of, um, respect. You're still a person. You're still a mother. You're still, um, going through things in trauma when you have sus substance abuse disorder and i've just recently um learned this in the past year 
when you go through trauma, your brain has one response and um, it's hard to break that, um, to break that cycle. Um, you go through these things while you're incarcerated and then when you get out, you know, you only know one thing to do until you learn to do something different. Um, you're always going to resort to what's, um, what's natural. That's just, that's, that's just the way that it is. And you know, Josh, can I add something? Because I, I think when we talk about kind of the criminal justice system, it goes hand in hand with how we do human services also in our Commonwealth. And so we've had this um, design for the last, you know, 10, 15 years where we have to separate families because they did something bad and we need to protect the kids from, um, from that person or that um, disorder that they're experiencing. And what we have found is we have well over 10,000 kids in the foster care system. And one of the most overwhelming sentiments from those kids is, I'd rather be with my mom. I, want, I don't wanna be separated. I wanna be united with that family. So I think one of the tricks is from a human services side of things and a criminal justice side of things that go hand in hand. How do we allow that person to get healthy and also stay united with their children so that they begin to learn how to help each other as a family unit? And so there's so much of that human services data that's available. And quite honestly, we're, we need a paradigm shift in this space um, because I think it's healthier for the kids. It's definitely healthier for the mom. And um, I think we can really figure out how to do this the right way. Well, that leads to the million dollar question, right? You, Senator Adams, have stepped up. You've reached across the aisle uh, on issues like this in the past. You're, you're reaching across the aisle on an issue like this. Again, given the sort of climate that we are in, not just in Kentucky, but nationally, uh, what do you think the, the chances uh, a bill like this has? And do you think that you'll garner the same kind of bipartisan support this time around that you were ultimately able to achieve two years ago? Um, you know, I'm always the optimist, so I always think that we can um, make progress when you have um, real conversations that are very respectful. And um, I think that the biggest barrier that any bill faces, particularly one that I think is traumatic in, um, in helping heal women and families, is um, education. And so it really matters how we talk about these issues. Um, it matters that I think that we talk about these human elements, you know, we share stories because these are real things. And um, I think that the more stories that we can share, the more impact that we see in our own communities, the more um, critical it is to changing lawmakers' perceptions. And, um, you know, we, we always talk about how we're for the kids or we're for the families. Well, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. And this is a real significant change that we can make in our systems that I think could really impact families. The other thing too is um, I think that most legislators have a good heart. And so it's vitally important that there is an significant advocacy component to this. Because the reason I change, I've been working on these issues is because I've had a lot of people come to me and talk to me and educate me. Each person in their own communities needs to um, mobilize and advocate and reach out to their state rep and their state senators and say, this is really important. This can change lives. Nothing gets passed without an advocacy component and without sharing those compelling stories. Um, and so if I had a charge for anyone on this call, it would be reach out, get to know your state rep, get to know your state senator, and tell them that I want to see this. Absolutely. Well, Senator Adams, I want to thank you again for, for joining us this morning. Uh, Jackie and Erica, I want to thank you all as well. Um, I've really appreciated it, and I, I think it was informative for people. Uh, I am now going to kick it back to Holly, uh, who's got a, a special sit-down interview uh, 
uh, for us with Congresswoman Karen Bass. And now we're so honored to have with us today the one and only Congresswoman Karen Bass from the 37th District of California. Congresswoman, thank you so much for, for being with us today. It was roughly two years ago that you were with me and with our, our team at Justice Action Network in Kentucky for a celebration of second chances. My, how far we've come, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. It was my delight. It was my first ever trip to Kentucky, and I am always happy to partner and work with you and all that you have done over these years. Whenever we, we talk about you and, and your commitment to these issues, I say, you know, it is the rare uh, member of Congress who will fly clear across the country uh, to Mitch McConnell's backyard to make the point that it's time for transformational change um, for our broken justice system. So we really appreciated it. You were appreciated it. You were a huge hit. Of course, you uh, received a, an award for all the advocacy that you're doing in the criminal justice reform space, particularly um, as it pertains to incarcerated women. And, and we're going to get to that in just a second, all that you've been able to accomplish and all that you hope to ac accomplish for incarcerated women. But first, I just wanted to ask you, you know, you have been um, all over the news and really are now a household name and a household face, um, you know, after having been for um, the Democratic ticket to, to serve as, as vice president. And we were so proud of you through that process. You were always so positive and had a, a big, bright smile. And, but, you know, no one really ever asked you much about you know, um, you know, your family and your background, and, and I would love to know more about your district. Uh, there's only one member of our Justice Action Network team that's ever been to the 37th District of California, and I would just love to know more, um, you know, about you, your background, and your constituents. Sure, absolutely happy to share that. Well, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, and I am very honored to represent a district that I've been in pretty much my whole life. And so to give you an example of my district, for those folks that are familiar with the battle between USC and UCLA, I represent that entire part of Los Angeles from USC to UCLA, including Culver City. And the best way to describe my district is there's one part of my district that is very affluent. And then there is another part of my district that is inner city, South Central Los Angeles. Wow. And so I first got involved in these issues at, at the time in the 80s. I was working on the faculty at the USC Medical School and saw the crack cocaine epidemic take root in South Central and became so concerned that I was watching society incarcerate what to me was a health and an economic issue. And I was so concerned that we were not addressing the root causes by providing support for drug treatment and also jobs so people wouldn't resort to drug trafficking. And so I left my cush little job and I started a uh, nonprofit organization to try to come up with solutions to address crack cocaine and gang violence that didn't involve incarceration at, unless it was absolutely needed. Now that was 30 years ago. Now we understand when we're in the middle of a new drug epidemic, we understand that it is a health issue. And so we understand addiction much better. And now we're beginning to unravel all of the policies that we put in place when we were very angry with people who were addicted and we're taking a second look at our criminal justice system. So I was on the front line trying to prevent the policies that went into place that led to mass incarceration, but I'm happy to be on the other side of it now and trying to unravel those same policies. Wow, that sports rivalry, uh, it sounds a lot like UK U of L, so I, I feel your pain. <laughs> You know, you mentioned addressing the, the crack cocaine disparity, um, and you were actually able to do that as one of the architects of the First Step Act that passed a couple of years ago, um, you know, after your uh, glorious trip into the, the bluegrass state, I might add. Um, and, and that bill, actually, in addition to including your provision about, um, you know, prohibiting the shackling of pregnant women, um, it also included the, the uh, Fair Sentencing Act and made that act retroactive. And, and after that provision um, was uh, implemented, you know, thousands and thousands of black men and women have come out of prison as a result of making that provision retroactive. And I just wanted your thoughts on, you know, the impact of the legislation that you were so instrumental in passing. 
Well, it was a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to work across the aisle. And, you know, that's why I'm so happy that you're doing this, Holly, because the general public perception is, is that Democrats and Republicans hate each other, that all we do is fight. And you know very well that that's not the case. We might have our differences, but we don't hate each other. I do admit we engage in a lot of theatrics in hearings, and that's what gets broadcast on the news. But what's rarely covered in the news is when we work together in the first step act was a perfect example of that and so the idea that thousands of people have been re, are, that are returning citizens back into their communities uh, is definitely a source of, of pride but one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight women is because in the whole movement now to roll back some of the policies we put in place when people talk about criminal justice reform most of the time they're only talking about men. They forget about women and they forget about children. And it was because of crack cocaine. It was the first time in our history that women started using drugs equal to men. And that's why you had an 800% incarceration rate for women, especially for black women, uh, because of crack cocaine. And I think it was about 500% for, uh, for white women. So we need to pay attention to women in the criminal justice system as well. And, you know, speaking of the unique challenges that women in the justice system face, you know, a lot of those challenges um, have actually been exacerbated by the global pandemic that we're facing with, um, with COVID-19. And I know you were very, very angered, as was I and so many women all across this country and men all across this country, with the story of Andrea High Bear. Um, the young Native American woman um, who um, a judge saw fit uh, to send to prison during a global pandemic for the charge of maintaining a drug-involved premises. Um, very low-level, nonviolent offense that even Brett Tolman, former U.S. attorney, staunch conservative, you know, says is a rarely prosecuted charge. And of course, you know, um, the rest is history. She she gave birth. Um, uh, she had, she contracted the virus, um, gave birth, and, and died shortly thereafter. And so, you know, her child and all of her children will never grow up knowing their mother. And it just disgusted so many of us. Um, and I know that, that that really impacted you as well. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what needs to be done. What Certainly what has, there are some um, steps that have been taken, um, but what more needs to be done to protect, um, especially, um, you know, women with comorbidities and, you know, pregnant women, um, you know, during this um, really tumultuous time? Well, you know, um, one of the things that was shocking to me, especially at early stages of the pandemic, everybody seemed to understand nursing homes People didn't understand prisons and jails and the fact that there is no way you could socially distance, very little access to hygiene. And so why would we be surprised that you would have massive outbreaks? So why on earth would you send anybody to prison unless you absolutely had to because they were a danger to people, they had committed a horrific violent crime. And what we found was people were still not really uh, reacting to the pandemic in a way that made sense. So this is a time that we actually need to review who is incarcerated currently and who can we send home. And you know that the incarceration of women, the reason why women go to prison is very different than men and women are very uh, rarely violent. And so I believe that uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, we should send people home. I don't know that the death of Andrea High Bear makes any of us feel in this country feel any safer. Safer, exactly. Um, really, um, really a tragedy. Um, but I know, you know, as a result of, of that story and so many others, that you've been moved to work across the aisle yet again um, on um, some legislation, the Pregnant Women in Custody Act. And I wanted you to be able to talk about that legislation and, and also share the prospects for it and what, you know, those of us out there who are watching this can do to, to help you pass this important bill. Well, absolutely. And I will tell you that uh, I'm very optimistic that the bill will pass. We do have bipartisan support. And just think about it. I will tell you that when we first set out to address this issue, most of my colleagues really weren't aware. It never occurred to them that there would be women that would be incarcerated who are pregnant and that how a prison deals with incarceration 
uh, of pregnant women is something that has to have special treatment. And so, for example, let's just take the nutritional needs of a woman uh, who is pregnant. In some cases, we find out that the prisons are addressing uh, their nutritional needs by giving them an extra peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, how does that work for a woman that, that is pregnant? Some of the stories that we have heard from women was so sad. We did a uh, telephone town hall the other day with one of my Republican colleagues, and a woman who had delivered in jail told us about how when she went to her prenatal appointments, they would do ultrasounds, they would listen to the baby, they would never show her the ultrasounds, they would never let her know anything about the baby. She didn't know what the gender was, they wouldn't tell her anything. And That's just cool. Baby, That's cool. and, I mean, it's just unnecessary. Yeah. And when the baby was born, they wouldn't even let her hold the baby. They took the baby immediately. She barely got to see the baby. And it was just tragic. And you think of what happens to a woman afterwards in a normal pregnancy, normal situation. You could only imagine the emotional upheaval that that causes. And so our bill, the essence of our bill, is to say that if a woman is pregnant, you need to treat her health-wise just like you would if she was if she was not incarcerated, which means she needs extra medical attention, she needs prenatal care, she needs the appropriate diet, she does not need to be shackled and chained, uh, all of those things that, um, and by the way, unless it's absolutely necessary, send her home or send her to a halfway house because what is the reason that she would need to be incarcerated? I mean, you think of the young woman that passed away. I mean, she was incarcerated because there was drugs in her home. And, you know, oftentimes when women are arrested and incarcerated, it's because of their relationships with men. Uh, maybe the man was abusive. Maybe the man didn't allow uh, the woman to... to deal with the association of what was happening in terms of the criminal behavior in the house. You mentioned um, transferring incarcerated people to home confinement. There was a provision in the first CARES Act that you all were successful at passing that gave the BOP more discretion to move individuals who had been convicted of low-level nonviolent offenses to home confinement. Well, we now know that the BOP has not exercised that discretion in a responsible way. And so, you know, we're looking at potentially another package, whether it's a COVID relief package or it's part of a CR, whatever. There's going to be an opportunity for another piece of comprehensive legislation. And, you know, there are a lot of, of uh, uh, piecemeal pieces out there, like, for example, the Portman Carden bill that would um, allow uh, business owners with records access to PPP right. funds, um, the Durbin Grassley bill that would expand elderly and compassionate release, and then, of course, the legislation that you are sponsoring um, with Chairman Nadler that Justice Action Network is very supportive of, which provides more resources to justice systems, state and local justice systems that are reducing incarceration, really need more help with reentry um, right. services. Um, and, and really, um, this is more help for law enforcement leaders that are actually acting in a responsible way. Um, I was hoping you could share with our viewers, what are the prospects of being able to include um, justice system related um, emergency relief in the next package and what will your role be um, in that process? Well, definitely we will look to do that. And we actually, in the HEROES Act, wanted to be stronger. I mean, we offered the BOP the opportunity to use its discretion, it didn't. So now that puts us in a position of saying you have to. Uh, I am, uh, it is unfortunate, however, that the uh, continuing resolution which is just a way to prevent the, governor, the government from running out of money that will be passed at the end of September. The deal that was made, it won't include anything related to the coronavirus. So it won't happen this soon. I'm not exactly sure when we will be able to pass the next coronavirus relief package, but you can be assured that we will make sure that there is justice related legislation there. Holly, I also might mention that I'm working on another bill. It's not quite ready just yet, but it's looking at women in the criminal justice system, period, from every aspect, why women get arrested, what happens when they're incarcerated, and what happens when they come out. Because when you incarcerate a woman, I mean, when you incarcerate anyone, you incarcerate their family. 
But when you incarcerate a woman, the family can fall apart. The children can wind up in foster care. And so we really want the justice system to say, only incarcerate women when you have to, and not for very minor nonviolent offenses. We need to have community-based resources so that if a woman does need to be confined, she should be confined in her community or nearby. Because there aren't a lot of women that are incarcerated, they are often incarcerated far away from their homes. And one thing that you know very well, women visit men. Men don't visit women. Exactly right. And that is a real problem. And you can only imagine the problem that causes if a woman does not is not able to really see her children. Yeah, I mean, the all of the issues related to women are so heartbreaking. And I remember going to a Louisville um, uh, facility and um, the men were getting, you know, the director said the men were getting all kinds of visitors and no one ever came to see the women. And one of the reasons why is because they changed so dramatically, you know, physically, emotionally, um, uh, mentally, again, because they're not able to see or connect with their children. Um, and so I'm, we're really grateful that you're working on these issues. And I will have to say, um, I was watching uh, Congressman Guy Reschenthaler, your, your friend uh, across the aisle, Republican from Pennsylvania, um, who was talking about some of the work that the two of you all are doing related to incarcerated women. He actually said glorious things about you and then even got Dana Perino of Fox News to say that she's rooting for your all's legislation. This was said on Fox News. So I thought that was a real... <laughs> a real endorsement, especially during, you know, such a politically acidic time of the, the great work that you're doing and the broad impact that it's having, you know, all over the, all across the political spectrum. Uh, but, uh, and, I, and I, I hate to then pivot to uh, an issue that is, is not having um, uh, a lot of success, um, you know, from a bipartisan standpoint, and that's policing reform. And um, there was very recently a story um, that we certainly seized on and amplified that you've been working really hard to try to engage your colleagues across the aisle on, you know, broadening um, a policing reform package and agreeing on a consensus framework that you could then uh, potentially take um, to the Republican-led Senate. Um, how are negotiations going on policing reform? Do you think there's any hope for getting a package across the finish line this year? Well, I certainly hope there is. I have definitely not given up hope. And unfortunately, you know, we've had additional killings and, um, you know, additional people in the street. And, and I wholeheartedly endorse the peaceful protest. And I'm just so discouraged when those peaceful protests break down. And, um, and but I, I will tell you that I have been working with Republicans from day one. And we did come up with language that uh, is now with Senator Tim Scott. And so the question is, can Senator Scott have a stronger bill? It is not the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that of course we feel is the gold standard, but it is another version of the bill that he introduced. And what the goal is, is for the Senate to pass a stronger bill and for us to go to conference. That is because that, as you know, is where the real negotiation takes place. And so we're hoping that happens. We will see. I will be in touch with Senator Scott in the next couple of days, and we'll see what happens. Well, however we can be helpful or any of our partner groups, um, from the far right to the far left, please um, you know, call on us for any assistance that you need in that regard. I know uh, we recently polled um, you know, policing reforms, and it was really amazing. I, I was shocked at the strong bipartisan support that these specific policies have with American voters. Um, and even, you know, reforms to qualified immunity, people have called that, you know, a poison pill. And it was one of the highest polling issues in our poll is being able to hold, um, you know, uh, bad conduct um, responsible in a, in a court of law. So um, we'll uh, be anxiously awaiting the outcome of some of those conversations and really rooting for you um, as you try to push for a broader package. And I just wanted to end Congressman Bass, uh, Congresswoman Bass rather, with a, um, that's my dog barking. This is 2020, right? 2020. Um, but just with, you know, just hope asking you about, um, you know, to, to share some, some comments about you know, what happens post-election this year? You know, we are in the most acidic political climate 
um, probably in my lifetime or that I can remember. Um, and you're still um, working hard, you know, to really engage anyone who's willing to, to be supportive of these um, criminal justice reform issues. Do you think we'll be able to continue um, that bipartisan cooperation, you know, post-election, um, you know, when obviously there's going to be a huge chunk of the American people one way or the other that are maybe bitter and disappointed? Well, I certainly hope we can, but you know, I do think that we have some danger signs, and uh, I think the the part of the election that I'm going to be the most concerned about is election day. Number one, will people be able to vote safely? Will people be able to vote from home? We're encouraging people to turn their ballots in early so that there won't be an issue with the post office. But I'm worried that if on election night the results are not clear, and if it takes several days, I certainly hope no more than that, but several days for the results to be uh, clear, then I absolutely worry about violence in the streets. I, I, I very much do. And so I think that we need to think about that over the next 60 days, because I think that's how many days we have left. And we need to be proactive and have contingency plans. And we need to make sure that neither side, neither side, ban the flames. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. It's really been a pleasure to work with you over the past couple of years. Um, certainly, we would not have been able to achieve all that we've achieved at the federal level, all the transformational changes without you at the helm. Um, and uh, I want to remind everyone um, that if you want to learn more about our work at Justice Action Network, you can go to justiceactionnetwork.org. And again, that's my dog barking. I'm so sorry. 2020. Um, and you can also follow us at, on Twitter at US Justice Action. We tweet a lot about Congresswoman Bass and all the great work that she's doing. Um, again, thank you everyone again for tuning in to episode four of Unconventional Women and the Justice System. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you. Appreciate it.